and also aliens, extraterrestrials, demigods, whoever else out there I've managed to lure in. All five of you. Well, I'm back now. Continuing on where we left off. <laughs> That's right, Brendan No time to lose. Hit the ground running is what we'll do. What do we have here? Are a series, small homes, and street views from Benicio, California. The surveyors couldn't be bothered to list any information about them. They just lumped them all together. We're calling it the City of Benicio. With captions like, View from front porch, southwest angle, up to the street yonder, and so on and so forth. So if they don't find them important enough to come up with a backstory, then neither shall I. Of course I can make up my own. This house belonged to the Honorary Judge uh, Winifred. It was built in 1842, a no-known architect, three-and-a-half-story building, plaster of a lath. The original front porch was torn down in 1912 and we did renovations, and uh, after that a family of Marmadukes moved in. Uh, from what I can gather, they run the gamut from wooden Victorian-style homes to bungalows to what appear to be churches that are somewhat repurposed. Here there should be something that looks like this on the top. This should be a four-pronged tower like this, but it's not. This looking mysteriously like the eye of Horus. But it's not. This looking like it shouldn't have aluminum foil on it. But it does! But it's a nice little stroll through the white picket fences of America. I might as well tell you about the city itself. Waterside City, located in the North Bay region of the San Francisco Bay Area. It was the capital of California, have we discussed, for 13 months? Nearly 13 months. Population, in 2010 at least, was only 27,000 people. It was Founded in 1847 by Dr. Robert Semple, Tom Larkin, and Comandante General Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo. On the land sold to them by General Vallejo. It was named for the general's wife, Francisca Benicia Carrillo de Vallejo, member of the Carrillo family of California, a prominent California dynasty. The general wanted to be named Francisca, but the name was dropped when Yerba Buena changed its name to San Francisco, so her second given name was used instead. William Sherman, the general, contended that Benicia was the best natural site for a commercial city in the region. It played a role in the gold rush because there was a tavern here. That's where the word was leaked. Gold had been found, one of the first incorporated cities in California, shortly after Sacramento. Mills College was founded here. The Pacific Mail Steamship Company established a major shipyard here. The prolific shipbuilder Matthew Turner formed the Marine Turner Shipyard here in 1883. And the Central Pacific Railroad rerouted the Sacramento-Oakland portion of the transcontinental line here to establish a major ferry across the strait from Benicia to Port Costa. The world's largest ferry carried entire trains across the strait from Benicia to Port Costa, from whence they continued on to the Oakland Pier. Yeah. The world's first power line crossing over the strait was built, and all this until World War II, the population was still merely 3,000 people. A major fire on March 22, 1945 destroyed most of the businesses, of course, including the century-old brewery and the hotel, with flames briefly threatening the capital. They closed the arsenal in the 60s, built a bridge, and joined the suburbs of San Francisco. This large, elegant house is the Riddell Fish House, one of the most sumptuous 19th century Benicia residences, res erected in 1890, According to Miss Ardella Fish Shanks, the granddaughter of the original owners, Frank Fish, uh, rather dubious name, whose name is Frank Fish, and then the daughter becomes Frank Ardella Fish Shanks, whatever. The land was owned by the Riddell family. George Hussey Riddell, Riddell, whatever, dry goods merchant in Boston, moved to California in 1849, moved to Benicia in 1852. Justice of the Peace from 1855 to 1873 and County Recorder from 1864 to 1866. So he was Justice of the Peace while he was County Recorder. In 1888, there's that number again, the ownership passed to his daughter Henrietta and her husband Franklin Fish. Miss Fish was an artist. She taught at St. Mary's. The house is notable for having a cellar under the kitchen. The stairwell is blocked off, and the cellar has a dirt floor. Hmm. So why would you dig a basement and then fill it with dirt? You wouldn't dig a basement and then not have a foundation underneath it. So what gives? And why blocked off? I think you and I both know the answer to that question. Some random decorations inside. All of this original to the property. This is, we are told, one of the two grandest houses in town. And here, a rare moment of romance between our surveyor and Mrs. Fish herself. Are you all done taking your photographs, sir? I'll be leaving now, miss. Thank you for everything. Really, it's, you've been a wonderful host. Won't you come and see me sometime? I'll make a point of it, madam. No. No wonder you were delayed several days, Mr. Surveyor. You were banging the fish woman! It is very odd that they would have such a photograph inserted in this. Although the caption does read, that's Frank Fish and Henrietta Fish, not not the surveyor and the current inhabitant, which I, I was hoping for a, a tryst, a, you know, romance in this bleak world. But that's Mr. Fish himself. How about that? And this would be the Hastings house. It sucks when you make up a nice fiction and then those pesky facts. Get in the way. Isn't that right, America? Isn't that right, world governments? Of course, you know all about that, wouldn't you? You bastards. 
This here is the old city hotel, the Golden Horseshoe. It was moved, divided into two sections, which were then put side by side. Currently an antique shop. Architect unknown. Hallway, boring. Some Navy Yard maps here, of the bustling bay. These here buildings are part of the Mayor Island Naval Shipyard. 1857. Allegedly, this was a masonry magazine, one of the key buildings in the ammunition depot area. They claim that the care taken in the design of this building, including the wreathed eagle detail at the entrance, illustrates the best of the design tradition of the beautiful Bureau of Yards and Docks. Yes, such great condition. Broken anchor and everything. This here Hansel and Gretel looking home is St. Peter's Chapel, part of the Mare Island Historic District, owned by the Navy. The second oldest Navy chapel in the U.S. and the oldest on the West Coast. Tiffany art glass windows, complete set of interior furnishings, an important memorial chapel to the U.S. Navy personnel, and a symbol of the sense of community that existed here. Entirely unmodified. Designed by Albert Sutton, born in Portland. The only thing notable that he ever achieved was one phase of the design of the state capitol building in Sacramento. Turned to Portland and died ten years later, and none of his buildings remain in California. Despite the fact that he allegedly designed several churches. One on Jekyll Island in Georgia. Really? All the way in Georgia. We are told this is the oldest building here on Mare Island. We are told architecturally it is among the most interesting and handsome. We are told it is the most important element of a core group of 19th century brick industrial building. We are told it's evolved over several decades, from the 1850s to the 1880s. We are told this is the smithy. The first permanent building. The first master plan for the base. Interesting side notes among the dozens of pages of data around this is that the Bureau of Yards and Docks had ignored the topography of the island and had located buildings with one end on level ground and the opposite end extended into the hillside so that they required the removal of 20 to 30 feet of soil to bring the foundation to grade. Hmm. 20 to 30 feet of soil had to be moved to make them down to grade, huh? I wonder where the soil could have come from. Such a grievous error, don't you think? America? I know I certainly do. Well, now, here we have the Volta Hydroelectric Power Plant from Lord Keswick and his electric power company. Now, this little beauty, this, is accompanied by a 183-page document detailing in painstaking excess. Every little tiny movement, litigation, merger, reconstruction, expansion, capitalization, decision, reorganization, Elimination, production, demand, initiation, operation, opportunity, etc., etc., et of the entire hydroelectric engineering complex and industry in California at that time. And it actually veers into historical American engineering record territory as evidenced by the H-A-E-R there. So this is kind of my free pass to get out of this one. <laughs> These guys, uh, I wouldn't do that, but whatever. They're smarter than me. They built all this. And the thing is, is that some of this, I don't even know where to place it. Not only is this doomsday device sort of like control panels, which are everywhere. These are everywhere. And they were abandoned after just a couple decades. It's it's one of those areas of the history that I don't really know what to make of. The buildings don't seem like they match. And many of them seem half buried, but yet the technology is there. The only thing I can think of is that a lot of it was pre-existing <laughs> and they just sort of repurposed it and refitted it and maybe revamped it because it says that there were 8,000 miles of canals dug between 1850 and 1860 and an additional 9,000 dug the following decade. Now, we're talking about it. Maybe. Maybe you could dig 8,000 miles. Maybe. In 10 years with an army of those. But we didn't have that. What we had instead was... Uh, one or two statewide of these steam shelves. But yet we were making things like this. And I just don't understand. I really don't. I'm, I'm at a loss. There's no way we built 9,000 miles of these. No way. So some of this looks very rustic. And some of this looks very plausible. And some of it, like the length of these canals primarily, just seem... So unlikely. I mean, where are all the men that are building all this shit? Where are all the men? This would have taken so long. But they threw these puppies up in, a, in five, ten years. And this Volta plant is one of 65. And rerouting creeks by the dozens to get here. Pipelines like this stretching for hundreds of miles. And this all just looking like it's old and re purposed re reconfigured and i mean there's just not enough men even on hand to do any of this stuff so this is for another day hey boy, you want me to scrape these rivets the wolf leave them there jenkins <laughs> i don't know what to make about it but what i do know is this building here is missing its dome how do i know that because of the blueprints right here 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 
It says down here, the building looked very rare when this photograph was taken, about 1853. Trees and shrubs, and especially the bunya bunya tree that flanked the front entrance, make greatly changed its have greatly changed its appearance. Well, yeah. But we're back here at this old building out here on Mare Island. This is a contributing element of Mare Island Highland District, historically significant as well as architecturally. The building served as the headquarters for the Mare Island Naval Shipyard for more than 120 years. Architecturally, it's one of the few no- remaining non-industrial brick buildings and illustrated the original architectural program. Not only that, but the octagonal cupola was destroyed in an earthquake in 1898. That's right, there was an earthquake. And that's what happened to the dome. It was destroyed, just the dome, in 1898, and never replaced. No! How could it be? Never heard of this earthquake. It's amazing how convenient these earthquakes and fires just happen to show up and just knock some key detail out, you know? And also, let me guess, these trees grow like anchors naturally. How dumb do you think we are? Well, we're dumber. And this whole area sunken in, of course, as you were... <laughs> that's funny. As you would imagine... In the history of Mayor Island, which we are, we've been exploring pretty much this whole time. You remember these bad boys? For some reason, the survey loops back around. We find ourselves back here. Back here at St. Peter's Cathedral. And these other buildings that we are assured were taken such good care of. That being a duel for the puppet show. It starts at four. I can't wait. And this is the empty swimming pool where we hangs up all the children that we kidnap. Y'all got any questions? I digress. The history of Mayor Island extends beyond the admission of California. Into the Union in 1850. Sailing vessels captained at the various times, sometimes by Francis Drake, or sometimes by people like Don Juan Perez de Ayala, will venture along the coastline searching for the famed seven cities. De Ayala, de Ayala had ventured along the coastline for many years prior to searching for the seven cities. Rather than finding those famed cities, he found instead a river in the sea and sailed to San Carlos through a wide channel to the greatest estero ever seen by the eyes of a Christian man. Many pagans, though, yeah, of course. But now we're talking about Christian men. It's different, okay? Now, while sailing through what was later to be known as the San Francisco Bay, the Ayala spotted a long, low, flat island with incredible imagination. He named the island Isla Plana, Flat Island, and then promptly left. Fifty years later, the flag of Spain vanished and was replaced by the Mexican emblem. Victor Castro was the first recorded owner of the island, who took the title from the Mexican government. Now, later on, it passed through many hands, sometimes getting lost in a hand of poker, sometimes getting gambled away, or an arm wrestling contest, or who knows. But during this period of time, the Mexican government decided that holding a garrison in the area of Sonoma would be beneficial for future control of California, and Mariano G. Vallejo and his family eventually settled there with a vast number of cattle and horses. And while the horses were being ferried northward, the raft overturned. One of the horses, a white mare, presumably named Shadowfax, was pulled westward by the currents, but swam ashore, and ended up on the island once named Isla Plana. She was discovered a few days later, and after her rescue, Vallejo changed the island's name to Isla de la Yegua, Island of the Mare. Of course, upon admission of California into the Union in 1850, the United States recognized the need for the establishment of a Navy Yard to support the Pacific Quadrant and so, uh, David Glasgow Farragut, the commander, was selected by Commodore Joseph Smith, chief of the Navy's Bureau of Docks and Yards, to establish a naval shipyard on Mare Island. A property been surveyed by a board of naval officers headed by Commodore John Drake Sloat in 1852, was purchased by the Navy forces, the Bissell Aspenwell MacArthur Combine, in January 1853, for $83,000, 491 cents. 990 acres, okay? 990. It'll be on the test. It's a fucking study up. And it's beautiful. And the military lives there, and they built it themselves, okay? And I don't care what you say. They wanted these dumb windows, these arches. They needed them, okay? They changed their mind later. Yes, it's true. And they cut rectangles in them. I don't know why, okay? But they needed them. And I trust the Navy with everything. With everything is in me. And you should too. Mm. Huh? Who the fuck is this fucking guy? <laughs> Man, I deserve an Emmy for that one. I don't even know how it turned out, but it's gonna be god-awful. Anyway... The Commodore, I'm sorry, the Commander, he, along with the civil engineer clerk and their families, arrived on Maryland, and they said, hey, we gotta repopulate this place, so, you know, there's simply no other way around it, ladies. Now, this is color photos of the aforementioned Watts Towers. I think last video we mentioned them. I don't know why they put these color photos at the end of the survey. I guess someone submitted some new ones. And what it looks like to me is a pre-existing metal structure, like this, covered in some sort of grout, almost, and then this artist guy pushed beads into it. Because there's no way this is bent from 
railroad tracks. Like he claims he did by hand. Let me get out of here. They look like this, probably. Ah, sorry. Ignore that black hole of imminent destruction. They look like this. This looked like this. And he just covered it in, like, clay or whatever. Concrete. And embedded all these little shards into it. Probably to mask what it really was. These are like some weird antennas or something that he found. It took off a roof. I don't know. Don't look right to me, America. Where can I find some friends that have an open mind? Hello, hello. That's what I'd say if it was the beginning of the video, but it's not. <laughs> Sorry, I took a break and I forgot what was going on. All right, strike that. Let's redo it. Now, let me just say, if I haven't said this before, that California sucks at organizing their historical building survey data. They don't follow their own codes. At one point, I actually put in the direct code that this photograph stated it was, and it said, oh, uh, you're going to have to see this page over here. I searched for that page. Oh, you're going to see this page over here. It's been moved over here. And then that one said, oh, it's been combined with this one over here. And it literally led me right back to where I started. And I think it was on purpose. So whoever you are, you little pencil pusher, you little clerk out there, you little butthole, having a laugh at my expense, are you? I'm shaking my finger angrily in your direction, sir. I have dogged determination. And so... Fine. You don't wanna. You don't wanna tell me what's going on. You don't wanna tell me what's going on with these buildings, huh? That's fine. I'll make it up. I'll make it up, and you'll see. I can be just like you. <laughs> Introducing the mission, San Francisco Solano de Sonoma in Sonoma County, Sonoma Town. Date of construction, 1823. This was Padre Jose Altamira, the last of 21 missions. One and a half stories. Blah blah blah. And they committed a cardinal sin, if you ask me, in 1911 when they. Did some restoration. They removed the belfry. Ooh, I can only imagine the riots, the pickets, the protests that must have went down when they took out the belfry. God damn. That's a bold move, sirs. A bold move. In case you were wondering which building was the mission, or how to read a map in general, this clearly says street, and then this clearly says buildings. So, just in case you thought, you know, this was the street, maybe, or that, and then this was the building. What do I know? Well, I know... I know a good backstory when I see one. Off in the distance, the small village lay, peaceful, unadorned by ornament, a simple folk, really, with its murky wooden roof rooftops, dusty windows, a sinister atmosphere. The main attraction, however, was the museum, which was built 67 years ago by vampires. The people lacked alchemical skills, but their biggest strengths were refined baking and a strong defense. Lord Hargus here, however, is most likely headed towards a cheerful future, but this remains to be seen. How'd I do? Pretty good? <laughs> Let's try again. Oh, you're gonna put this uh, tower here, eh? You're gonna just uh, put this little windmill here. You're not gonna tell me anything, eh? You're not gonna explain these broken windows? But let me guess, you imported it right from Pennsylvania. Well, where? well, there we were, sitting around watching television, and suddenly in came the Kool-Aid man! And he said, <laughs> What does the cooler man say? Man, I don't even remember. He says, uh, get fucked. <laughs> I don't remember what he says, but he said it and he burst in the window there and then there. And we were all like, dude, seriously? And yeah, this place has seen better days. Now, I can't tell who came first or which uh, picture came first. Look at these two. Tee, what's so funny? Well, we just pulled up here in our wagon. Luckily, it's just in time. Look at the thing. Just, just about to fall apart while we pull up in the yard here. And luckily, we found this here castle. Decided to move right in. Well, the weeds ain't been done in a while. Jeremiah's been a little lazy ass. Turned out there in that hammock. <laughs> but I mean, priorities, I guess. And yeah, Jeremiah, you got some splaining to do, bro. And really, I have nothing to offer here. Is this supposed to be real people? This looks like a drawing to me. Oh, yeah. That's what the Kool-Aid man says. Damn, what happened over here, dude? Had the building gone. Sure would like to know, but California doesn't want to tell me, so I can just freak right off. 909, September 909. So that means this is, this is 80 years old took for this bad mamba jamba to fall apart, because they say it was built in 1823. I at least know that much. The evil do that I do do. And this here, if you look very, very closely, you can see painting on the brick here. It says, Wells Fargo Company. See that? Wells. Right here. Here's the S. Here's the F. And that is how I know that this once was the Wells Fargo Bank. And right there, folks, I've just done the same amount of research as the people entrusted with the Historical American Building Survey in this town, which is called uh, Fort Mason. 
No, I don't remember. But look at this here's Fort Mason, which don't mind the name. I'm sure it's a coincidence, okay? But check this out. Boom! Ambush make over here. Now it's a finance office. You didn't see that coming, did you? Well, this is here's Jemadiah. He is waiting for the parade. He got a bad seat last year behind a very tall man with a very tall hat. And so he said, I ain't never letting that happen again. So he's waiting. He'll be here for months, probably. And this here's Downeyville. Do you know what Downeyville is? I shall tell you what Downeyville is. It's a census-designated place. It basically means the Constellation Prize. Not quite a city. Not quite a city. Not quite a town. It's on the North Fork of the Yuba River. And the population is about 290 people at last count. So, unless they've been making babies like rabbits up there in Downeyville, I reckon the population's about the same. Gold was discovered here. Of course, September 14th, 1849. By Francis Anderson, who had joined a man named Phil A. Haven. It was soon renamed after Major William Downey, the town's founder, a Scotsman who had led an expedition of nine miners, uh, that is, <clears throat> miners by trade, not of, not miners by age. Let's, let's clear that up. Mr. Major William Downey don't look around. Seven of them were African-American men. They struck rich gold, built a log cabin, and settled in to wait out the winter. By 1850, which, if you're keeping track, that's in three months. They had 15 hotels, 4 bakeries, 4 butcher shops, and numerous saloons. Wow. Famous for a young Californian resident of the town named Josefa Segovia. Segovia? I don't know. A young lady was lynched by a mob on July 5th. They held a mock trial and accused her of killing an American man named Frank, who accidentally burst into her hut two days in a row, drunk. Can you believe it? That's a common mistake. And she done killed him with a knife. If you believe any of this story, she took off her hat and waved it around the air and said, Adios, senores, and leaped off the scaffolding that they built in front of the whole town. And she went gracefully into the abyss. The only woman ever hung in California. They say on a cool, clear night, you can still see her wisping about in the shadows. Frank, Frank tried to love to me. I don't care if it is a doll. No means no. That's the rule around here. Downeyville tried to be the new state capital of California. Oh, just missed out. God. Uh, really, I could, <laughs> I could definitely see it being the capital. I mean, what a place. Let's talk about Mr. William Downey, if we may. I don't know how you arrive in California. June 27th, 1849. By October 5th, you have gathered a group of African-American sailors and one Irish lad. You reach the forks of North Yuba. You declare out loud, by God, the spot where this town stands is the handsomest I ever seen in the mountains. They found gold all along the river and without even needing a shovel to do so and decided to just name the town after yourself in a local election. And they dropped the name of the forks, which actually made geographic sense. How does one do that? This man also explored British Columbia at the request of Governor Douglas. This would be a few years later. He investigated the route from the Butte Inlet to the Caribou via the Homathco River. Whatever the fuck any of that means. And somehow, that led to the, uh, the Chilchicotten War. At the onset of the Big Bend Gold Rush of 1865, Downey appeared again, traveling up the Columbia River before steamboat service even began. Then, he left for Panama, where he sought gold and silver down in 1874 by grave robbing. Then he went to Alaska for the purpose of taking a cursed glance of this wonderful country. He died in 1893, just before disembarking San Francisco from Victoria, British Columbia. Now, I don't know how one does all that. I find it interesting that he was trying to seek gold and silver by grave robbing in Alaska, or down or in Panama. I mean, that seems a little odd. Are there are people in Panama known for being bold, buried with gold and silver, or what? But, you know, really, you find gold without uh, needing a shovel. I don't know. How, what, what is that? Gold is lying around. I mean, it sounds to me like these people were finding abandoned places and people and melting down whatever gold they had on them or on their properties or whatever. I mean, I, I just don't understand how you just find gold lying around. Don't even need a damn shovel. Just another one of these mysterious fiction. These people live these fictional lives, man. They're, they're larger than life. It's not even possible. You roll into a town, and suddenly it's named after you. Makes no damn sense. But yeah, the joke's on you, Mr. Downey, because only 200 people live there now, dude, so your town sucks. 
Now this here, this is Tamalek, built in 1858. Its builder and first owner was Captain Granville P. Swift. He came west with the Kelsey Party in 1843 and was also a member of the Bear Flag Party that seized Sonoma and said, California is for here, henceforth a republic. Captain Granville was a man of rough qualities and high ambition. He arrived in California in 1845 or 46, who can tell, having crossed the plains in 43. Born in 1822 in Kentucky, he became a notable horseman and marksman. He claimed that he was related directly to Daniel Boone. He worked for Sutter, of course, at the Sacramento Valley Fort, you know, Sutter from Sutter's Mill. The guy where gold was found. You know, these things are just, it is coincidence. There's only five people in California at the time, apparently. He also participated in the Bear Flag Uprising at Sonoma. It was here that he received his title of captain, having captained a band of men set out to rescue Todd from his Mexican California captors. Not sure who Todd is. He had a cattle ranch near Calusa with Indians as herders. When gold was discovered, he took some of his workers to the Feather River, of course, and managed to work about five or six thousand dollars a day with an eventual total of half a million dollars in gold. And this he took, he coined in his own octagon fifty dollar pieces with a personal mark on them. In 1854, he arrived in the Sonoma Valley with 350,000 worth of these gold pieces on mule back and 150,000 in other property. He purchased the Leonard Place of Major Beck and built on it a costly residence of cut stone, spending $150,000, which in 1840 money was probably like $9 billion. The property was estimated at 15,000 acres. His treatment of Indian workers is generally regarded as being extremely cruel. Various stories have come down and chained people to walls in the basement at night or hobbled them with cannonballs around their ankles. He had uh, some disastrous investments in the mining world, lost heavily and was forced to sell his house. He then removed to Green Valley, where his personality disintegrated into heavy drinking and bad luck. Death came in 1875 for this ambitious man when, on returning from a visit to a quicksilver mine, probably New Alameda, he fell from his mule and was not found until some time thereafter. In 1863, a Colonel Rogers, also called Supervisor Rogers. Well, let me clarify. He was only supervisor when he was working on a shift to KFC, but outside of that, he was the Colonel. <laughs> Colonel slash supervisor Roger six men to buy this here property. According to uh, the current owner at the time of this survey, research, he had participated in arson on the river steamer Martha Washington in 1852 in Ohio. But of this, he was acquitted. Later, he was convicted of bank swindling in New York, sent to prison, but pardoned. Upon a returning home from a trip to Nicaragua, he became a respected local citizen and gave no cause for criticism. Unfortunately, when President Grant came to visit Northern California in 1879, this place, Colonel Rogers' home, was chosen as a resting spot. On the way to Sacramento, in the investigations by a secret service that were assigned to protect President Grant, Colonel Rogers passed emerged from the shadows. He was forced to stand trial on old charges in San Francisco, but his lawyer brother, who had never been mentioned before, had taken the name of Reuben Lloyd, and he managed to get him acquitted on the statute of limitations. Colonel Rogers' old age was embodied by broken and humbled and discredited from his past. However, the official obituary, the Hearst paper, suggests that he emerged rather gracefully from all the scandal, lived at a ripe old age in Berkeley, dying at 89 years of age. He married Elizabeth Hathaway in Fairfax. Give me a break. Unfortunately, this house did not emerge so well from this troubled period and it fell into a dilapidated state. She and her famous newspaper husband, one of William Randolph Hearst's most trusted aides and editors, lived here for many years, reviving the old splendor. So, this house, owned by two men who randomly lucked out in gold trade, President Grant stayed here, for some reason, even though it's nowhere near a rail track, William Hearst's friend ended up buying, buying it. I mean, the whole thing is just ridiculous. And this house, you're talking about 1850. You're building this house. Who built this house? The nine African Americans that were with him that he used to chain up at night? Why wouldn't they just beat his ass and run off? Ah, oh, I'm Colonel Rogers. You work for me in the day and at night I chain you up. It's like, yeah, well, I work for you then for one day, Mr. Rogers. Unless you can catch me. It just seems ridiculous to even assume that this was built by these people. All this is, is gathered from a little unpaginated brochure called the Centennial of Timlock Hall, uh, a pioneer scrapbook here about California pioneers. Then there's a, the woman that bought this place has a little book called The Tale of Timlock Hall. So, who knows? 
She also claims that the small frame house that was a prefabricated building was shipped to California in 1850. Why? Why would you ship a small structure and then build a massive one? It makes no sense. The idea that this building could even be built in that era is, is quite ridiculous. And sober. Here is a little place called Knight's Ferry. This here is the powerhouse. Within a year of discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill, the population of California tripled, and there was an urgent demand for roads and bridges, for ferries, for turnpikes, for toll bridges. And aside from two tiny structures, there were no bridges in California prior to 1850. None. But John Little of Maine built the first covered bridge west of the Mississippi River, a 550-foot span across South Fork at Salmon Falls. By the mid-1850s, there were at least 100 Hundred toll bridges in California. In five years, hundreds of bridges, many of them covered. In 1938, there were still 30 of them, and today only 12 remain. This one, the Knight's Ferry Bridge over yonder, is the longest covered bridge west of the Mississippi River. You see, Knight's Ferry, named after, well, a former guide of John Charles Fremont's expeditions, after gold was discovered, Mr. Captain William Knight established a trading post and ferry on the river, considered ideal, most direct route from Stockton to the mines. Yes, sir. Quickly became a link, essential link, and heavily traveled route. And David Locke constructed a dam here and built a sawmill and a flour mill here, that you're seeing here on the screen. Mining commenced on the river, land was surveyed, lots were sold, a town was established, and Knight's Ferry had a population of about 800 people. Wow. The people were upset, though. All 800 of them. They wanted a bridge. They had merely a ferry boat. Very well. There's a 1982 history of Stanislaus County, where the author states that John and Louis Dent had plans for bridging the river, and... A brother-in-law of theirs, who happened to be named President Grant, may have designed and drawn the plans for the first bridge ever. Of course. President Grant just pounding around out here in the dust in California. Drawing up bridges and shit. That sounds very believable and presidential. California not being very far from D.C. at all. Especially in those days. Why, with the ruby red slippers, you just simply tap your heels and say bop bop. Hey guys, you like my new braces? No, we don't, house. Shed, whatever you are. This would be the Dent House. Them same dent fellers that knew President Grant. Wow, what a small world. And well, since again, California's just uh, really doesn't want to uh, do their homework or provide any information about any of these things, it's left up to me. So this here is the animal-powered cloud circulator Monotron. Uh, and it was abandoned uh, by the uh, Echo Ground Mining Company, uh, which was run by a man named Edward Gifford Boodle. <laughs> and Mr. Boodle here, he's a charming fellow, earnest, adaptable, with brown hair awkwardly hanging over a tense face and wide violet eyes. He used to watch delightedly over the spirits whose souls they would harness and trap and force to toil away in these fields of wheat. Hell, I don't know. Just do your damn job, California. We won't have this damn problem. <laughs> The house yelled angrily. Fuck you! Da, 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 da. The house started screaming, made Miss Wilde so terrified she done run up on the curb. Here's where the blacksmith used to hang out in his days off. I thought it was weird too. Now we're in Weaverville, home of this twisty staircase. This here is a historic California gold rush town. Once home to 2,000 Chinese gold miners. And even had its own Chinatown. And did I mention the twisty staircases? Logging and tourism were the economic mainstays of Weaverville. However... Only about 3,000 people live here today, and some twisted staircases. And weirdly, only 1% of them is Asian. Yeah, I know. It's like, what happened to them all? This here is the Temple of the Forest Beneath the Clouds. A Taoist temple, built in 1874. California's best preserved temple of a gold rush era Chinese place of worship. Now we're going to go in here, just for a minute, okay? Because I'm going to shop around a little bit for my nephews, if y'all don't mind. You can check out the rest of Weaverville. Careful there, that's a heavy-duty navigation circulator. Here we have yet another gold mining town. Tular, Tulare, Tulare, Tulare. I don't know how you say it. You do it! This is the International Order of Odd Fellows Hall. Seen better days. They, like everyone, seem to have moved on. Oh, I'm glad that the power lines are still here. This is what it looked like in its prime. Just a bunch of villagers just piddling about. And that there is St. Anne's Church. Established in eight. 1855. The architect was John Wallace. The Gotham shaped window had four panels of colored glass. St. Anne's was completed in less than a year, consecrated by Archbishop Alamany. The belfry was added in 1857, probably the one that they took from the other place. 
The bell was cast by Manilis in Troy, New York, and dated 1857, oh, of course. So it was made and shipped all the way here to this dust bucket out here in these dusty plains in less than a year. Someone found out about its existence and brought it here. Okay. In 1872, it underwent major repairs despite being less than 15 years old. In 1880, there's that year again, the altar paintings were added by Jimmy Fallon, the son of a pioneer hotel owner and future talk show host. However, 30 years later, it was declared unsafe and closed. Well, they reopened in 1926 after they repaired it. St. Anne's, there she stands, for the women's and the man's. And all of these stories are just getting dumber and dumber. Wow. These look electric, don't they? Pedro contemplated whether or not to leave the city now. The rivaling gangs have spiraled into an all-out war. Soon, the entire city will be a battleground, and the government apparently plans to surround the city and let the gangs fight it out. Better to let them kill each other than risk soldier lives, they say. Somewhat distrustful of the situation, this young man somewhat grudgingly agrees to the proposal. But was the right choice made? What if his friend was wrong? What if this is all far bigger than what he's been told? How could an ordinary young man be helpful at all? Well, Pedro, if there's anything I've learned, it's better to regret something you have done than something you haven't done. Oh, gee, that's a normal-sized door knot. I wonder what's down there. And why were we building basements in Weaverville? Hmm? Can anyone riddle me that? Can anyone riddle me what's down there? And why? And that's the old Jewish cemetery. You must never enter there under any circumstances. Uh, unless you're doing some work for a survey, then go right ahead. Oh, thank you, madam. Actually, I must place my coffee cup. There it is. There it is. And why there's a Jewish graveyard here in Weaverville? God only knows. And even he might have to Google it. Funny bit about this house here. We're the only ones that they bothered to leave information about, which, <laughs> once you hear the story of this one, you may understand why they abandoned Katie House. It's in its original condition. It does have a basement. The foundations and basement walls are of rubble, limestone. The chimneys, fireplaces, and garden walks are red brick. This building is said to have been constructed in an eastern seaboard city, probably around Baltimore, shipped, knocked down, around the Horn, to California, and reassembled on the site. This explanation would account for the refined millwork and moldings which are characteristic of this house. Uh... Keep your day job. Look at these people. They look like they're sitting amongst a... Just a pile of, like, plunder. Like, they've stolen so much stuff and just gathered it all around them. Like, nah. Now what do we do? We've gathered all this wealth. Well, let's just sit amongst it and glower at each other. Yeah. Big piles of dirt everywhere. And this here is the St. James Episcopal Church, which we are told nothing about. Which looks entirely reasonable for someone who have been built in this era. Oh, wow. Look, at it. it's not the only one, either. Look at that. Steeples galore. What's this? Oh, this looks exactly like cowboys' architecture. Yeah. And what are these? Why are those there? What the fuck is going on around here? Don't worry. As long as this nice pair of rocks has a rice paddy hat with which to hide under from the hot summer shade, then all will be well. Everything's a face. In my world. In a world of my own. There'll be pirates. With the patches over her eyes of violets, they'll be sneering, smiling at the twilight. In a world of my own, there'll be chickens reading tales of Charles Dickens, children hiding in the thicket. In a world of my own, there'll be boomers stuck in the garden like some tubers. They'll be garden. There'll be three-point shots by James Harden There'll be bells and belfries in the yard And there'll also be a really dead barn Look at it! Oh my god, we're here to solve the case of the dead barn Dun 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 Clearly, there's no life left in him But who could have done such a thing? Speak to us now from beyond the grave, won't you, housey? It was Supervisor Rogers! Damned Colonel! Oh, oh, here we are we're here at the temple of the in the forest under the cloud. Although, seems to be a lot of other things getting in the way. That's the privy. If you don't know what that means, then, well, learn it. There'll be koi fish. It will be hard to tell a girl from boy fish. Mom, Pedro throw my maracas on the roof. Quiet down, children. I'm just going to be a minute. I'm going here and shop around for my nephew. He just loves stuff, I guess. You may enter. Intrude. Enter. Hmm. 
Uh, hello? Enter. You may enter. A uh, smaller door here. How about now? Enter. Go ahead. I fucked up the joke. No going back. It's what we do. We are raw, unedited. Not uncut, because we do sort of trim the silence out. But actually, that's a bot that does that for me. I'm so advanced. I have robot friends. Would you like to meet her? I'm much more kind to her than uh, Captain Swift is to his help. All right, very well. Oh, hey there. What's up? Hello, Serpentia. Hello. You can, uh, knock off that fake accent. We are here, in this gold mining town, in a Chinese temple. I'm wondering if you could help me shop for my nephew. I'd be glad to help if I can. Okay, so what do you think? What of all these trinkets and things, what do you think he would appreciate? I see this lamp here, this chandelier type thing. What do you think of that? I like lamps. I think the idea of a chandelier is cool. Okay, okay. What about these screens over here? I like the screens. So which one would be better? Um, I don't know. Wow. I think so, too. And they look good. I, I write. I'm not measuring it here to see if it... He's a very tall person, you know. Really? Oh, yes. Don't get your uh, greedy little grubby little... I won't. Now, who's this guy? Thanks. It is my pleasure. But I'm afraid you're wrong. What makes you think that? He was born in a small family in an important port. Lived in peace till he was about 12 years old. But gradually, things begin to change. Yes. Things are always changing. It's true they are. What makes you happy? I'm hoping you can stop talking in such a creepy fashion. Now take a look at that spread. What do you suppose those are? Are those lychees? Have you had one before? No, I haven't. Well, what's in the box? Look in the box, Brad. Looks in the box. And what did you see? A giant leech. Is that what that is? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Well, I'll take the leech then. You better. And, uh, let's see what this says here. I'm impatient. Mm, really? Yay, really. This appears to be a prophecy. When the sun turns dark, the prophet shall bring the rise of the poor. It shall be then, when animals rain from the sky, a suspicious malfunction shall bring an end to the gods. There comes a day when the new becomes the old, a mocked child shall usher forth broken friendships and fury. Once the sky is colored brightly, a drunken fight shall mark a rise of faith. Not bad for something I completely made up. Thanks. Not you. Now, who are these men? They are friends of mine. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. What are their names? Oh, yes. Funny looking, but that one is a sweetie. <laughs> oh, is he? Which one? The one in the back? Well, the first one is the one I'm talking about. Oh, okay, okay, this guy. So what about the guy in the back there? What's his name? A-Divin. What about these little guys? What's their story? I have a handle on it. See, I think they're mad because they don't have tacos. You promised us taco. Why you not give us taco? Silence! And here is the levitating cannon. That sounds awesome. Ooh. Ooh. Don't you think we've spent enough time in this store? But I don't have anything for Cody. That's very sad. Forget all this writing on the wall. You don't read Chinese anyway. All right, I gotta go. Later, robot friend. <gasps> Can't believe I called a friend. And just like that, Wang Chao disappear, leaving only hat on wall. Let's get the fuck out of here, bro. And here's what it looks like today. Nice and freshly painted. Ah, Weaverville's not so bad, is it? No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Let's go back in now. That's all colorful. Hello? Enter. Banga. At the most beautiful house I've ever seen in my life. This here, cabin is allegedly where Mark Twain wrote a book. It's true. Well, it's true that that's what they say anyway. But I mean, even Mark Twain's name isn't even real. It's like James Sampson or something. And this isn't even the actual cabin because the first one burnt down and this one was sort of built around this chimney which remained. So so there you have it. And wow, I feel like this was a very disjointed and probably terrible chapter. A uh, very forgettable in this tour. So I apologize for everything and I'll make it up to you sometime. Hey, mom! mom, mom.